Welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. It is Friday, November 20th, and this is really getting down to it. I mean, here we are starting to, we're going to talk about Thanksgiving, talking about the holiday season and what you're all going to do. I just sent out a note to some folks about, should we be looking at Black Friday amid COVID? What's it going to look like? I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's a week from now. And so get your hands ready to click away if you've got some pent up demand ready to be unleashed. We'll see. Meanwhile, because this is a program focused on you, we want to encourage you to send us an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. That is our email address. And don't forget to let us know if you'd like to come on the show with us because we'd love to have you. And it's more fun to be talking to you directly than me reading your emails. But I'll keep reading your emails, so don't worry. Okay, Susan writes, our financial advisor is talking to us about a Delaware statutory trust. We sold some land and we're going to have to pay big capital gains. The DST invests in medical buildings only. What do you think? Uh, um, Okay, I guess this is a way to probably defer the capital gains, but I don't know anything about medical buildings. And I mean, I guess I have a, a sense that medical buildings probably are a good place to be if you're gonna be in anything in commercial real estate, but I don't really know enough about this. And I don't know how big the capital gains are, but capital gains rates are just not that high right now. So, I mean, it depends how much you have earned. The long-term capital gains rate is 20% if you earned more than $496,000 as a married couple, and sometimes you have a Medicare surcharge. So it's essentially 23.8%. If you have income of 80 to 496,000 or so, it's 15%. And I'll tell you what, I really would want to know the cost of these things and how much it is going to be to get in and out of it, how liquid it is. A lot of questions to ask may not be worth it. Maybe paying the capital gains at these lower rates is a preferable idea. Just saying. Okay. Jasmine writes, I saw Jill on CBS TV. In December, I will be getting an inherited IRA from my father who passed away 10 years ago. There's approximately $20,000 in there, and I'd like to allow the money to grow tax-free, but I know I won't be able to leave it in there too long because it's not my IRA. I don't have my own IRA or savings account, and honestly, I struggle to keep control of our finances. Please advise the best options. Well, this is interesting. I wonder why, I wonder why this is 10 years ago. I mean, there's a few things that I want you to think about. Number one is because your father died 10 years ago, you could probably be able to stretch this. You were probably able to stretch this over your lifetime. But if you're really struggling as a family or even as an individual, maybe it makes sense to take some of the money out a little bit at a time as long as you, you know, you have to pay the taxes due, but I don't know what your tax bracket is. Maybe if you, um, if you make up to, let's say, $80,000, if you're married filing jointly or about 40000 as a single, maybe taking some of the money out a little bit every year might be helpful. So Jasmine, what I'd love for you to do is to send me a follow-up and tell me what's going on in your life. And then we can have a better idea as to how to manage the, the funds that are going to be in this inherited IRA. Okay. This is from Philip. First of all, thank you for all the help throughout the years. Thanks to yours and other podcasts and you on CBS this morning. I've really taken a hold of my own finances over the past five years or so. Hmm, That's great. Anyway, Philip goes on to say, I'm in the middle stage of money knowledge. I hear you mention things and I just can't grasp them. So I'm hoping that I could ask you one of my questions. Can I max out a Roth IRA and a SEP IRA, the one where you can contribute 25% or up to $56,000 a year? Yeah, you can. You can do that. Now, the thing is, for the Roth, you still have to stay within the ranges for income. So if you are single, and we're talking about 2020, if you make less than $124,000, you can do a Roth. Now, if you make more than that, you could do a backdoor Roth in addition to a SEP IRA. So I think that you're going to have to be a little bit, you know, 
you're going to have to be a little careful. Also, I'd really want to know a little bit more about your other stuff going on in your life. So, you know, the, the SEP limit is for a SEP IRA, you can put 25% of your compensation up to 285 grand. And the maximum, as you said, is 57,000. It goes up a little bit next year. So, I, I mean, some of this has to do with what else is going on. I think you'll be able to do it, but, you know, as a result, I would encourage you to give me a little bit more about sort of big picture stuff. Okay, next question from Philip. Oh, Philip, you're going to bounce someone out of the queue because there's so many questions in here. <laughs> um how do I go about figuring out my tax liability when I'm converting a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA? Do I do my taxes and see what my AGI is and then take the difference? You can ballpark it, you know? Um, yeah, you should be able to look at last year's tax returns and look at the tax bracket that you're in now and be able to just take the amount that you're trying to convert and add it to your income and have the tax brackets in front of you and see what you would need to stay within your tax bracket. Okay. So don't overthink this. This is like math. This is not higher, you know, some physics or something. All right, Philip, next question. I'm thinking of buying a lake house that I would use personally and rent out for some rental income. Does this make sense or should I just take all the excess money and put it in the market? Um, he's got 285 grand in retirement accounts, 60 grand in brokerage accounts, 230 grand in cash, maxes out the Roth IRA each year and his 403B and 457 plus puts extra money towards brokerage. 114,000 on a mortgage, that's at 3.1%. Fixed expense is 2,000. Should I invest in a second home or put more into my brokerage account so I can retire earlier? I'm 42 and will receive a pension upon retirement. Okay, I mean, you have to decide whether you want the house or not. I mean, I wouldn't buy the house and rent it out. I would just buy the house to have it. Why do you need to rent it out? So if you want to do that, you've got plenty of cash, you 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 get a mortgage to do it and yeah, you can you can probably pretty well afford to do it. It doesn't sound like you have any any other responsibilities. You didn't mention kids or other family members. So yeah, I think you're okay. But again, every time you put money into real estate, you're tying up your dollars and you're impinging on your future flexibility. That's what I would say. So just be careful. Cheryl writes, I'm new to many adult things. My family has never been good with money and I'm determined to break the cycle. Last year I met with a financial advisor and I sometimes worry he's just trying to sell me products or services. Other times I see the value. I'm married. We're both 36. We have no plans to have children. We have term life insurance um, for $500,000 each. The advisor wants us to eventually purchase some whole life. Ding, ding, ding. This is not a, uh, an advisor who has your best interest at heart. Just not, Cheryl. You do not need whole life. You do not need whole life. You do not need whole life. Okay? Um, Cheryl goes on. We have long-term disability, covers 50% of our pay. Is it too much or not enough? It's probably fine. And Cheryl goes on and says, we have equity in our home. We bought it cheap in 2012. No credit card debt. I have $75,000 in student debt. It's on a 12-year plan to be paid off, if not sooner. Am I being taken for a ride or does it seem like he has our best interest in mind? Best regards, Cheryl. Okay. I don't know if you're being taken for a ride, but don't buy whole life insurance. That's 100% clear. What I would do is that I would be very hell bent on getting that, set, that student loan debt paid down sooner rather than later. So I don't know if you've got federal loans or not, but here we are, federal loans at 0% through the end of this year. And I think that that would be a great thing to do is to accelerate some of your payments right now while you're at 0%. That would be my big takeaway. I, I mean, taken for a ride is a little dramatic, but it's not a fiduciary. That's for sure. Okay. And so don't buy whole life. And I'd be interested to know what else this person has done for you. All right. That is it. That is the show. Thank you so much for listening. If you have questions, send us an email, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com or hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com. We've got a contact button there while you're there. Guess what? You can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. It's free every Friday. Totally great. As always, wash your hands, wear your masks, maintain your physical distancing. And how about putting your hands metaphorically on someone else's back today? 
try to do something nice. We'll talk to you tomorrow.